Kevin. Hey, there you are. Hey. How's it going? Great, man. What, um, um, amazing to meet you. How's it, where are you? In, in Sydney? I'm in my studio. I'm in my recording studio. Ooh. Can I have a look around? <laughs> yeah, sure. It's a big, it's a big, uh, it's a big computer, but uh, I have a big motherfucker of a console, and it's dark and rainy outside. So wonderful. Well, epic to meet you. Uh, most importantly, have you got uh, have you got the uh, whiskey with you? Oh, uh, sure. Did you, get, did you get that part of the brief? Oh, I didn't, but I have whiskey. That's kind of the. Uh... <laughs> the premise how am i doing okay you're doing good well am i just want to tell right? you not bad you, you're in the you, you're invited to the club glenn city <laughs> 15 and lefroy and uh okay well what are you going to choose and why i'm going to have the glenn city 15 oh nice because it's open fair enough uh practical man that's what i am <laughs> all right so I, I do want to tell you you know these shows i i normally record them at like nine o'clock at night okay right so it's 9 30 in the morning kev but in the honor of actually getting to speak to you uh, i'm joining you right okay cheers cheers i'm drinking a, a scotch an arian malt limited edition scotch if you care oh uh, look at you fucking snob fresh out of the freezer that's You're me. A fucking snob. I'm just drinking expensive shit. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I'm a happy little Vegemite today. Oh, I like it. Kev, yeah. I didn't uh you know, you are your name is so legendary uh to me. And I remember the first, you know, I just when you worked with the nude girls from afar, and I always thought you were a benevolent American producer working with a South African artist, but I now discover you are from here, right? I am. I am. I'm, I was. Uh, I was uh, born in Johannesburg, and uh, I was there pretty much. Um, I was expelled from Northview High School when I was a standard six, and then I went to St. Andrews. Well, hold on. School. Slow down. Slow down. Slow down. For what? <laughs> oh, you know, it was stupid. I mean, it's. It, it was. It. I. If, uh, there's been a few chaotic events in my life that have all been for stupid reasons, and I was sort of expelled for. Um, if the truth be told, I was writing in my science, I had been drawing in my science textbook. And and uh, this is the real true story, you never told yet, by the way. So I had been writing in my science textbook and I had been writing all sorts of stuff and drawing naked girls and everything. And um, and I also wrote, you know, stupid six, you know, standard six jokes. I said, you know, how could Jesus walk on water because shit floats? And um, <laughs> and and that's when and I'd written that in my science textbook. So the science teacher found it, and she was she was c concerned about this this behavior, and so she <coughs> called in my parents and said, "We're concerned about your son. You know, um, his, these things are written in his science textbook." And I said, "Oh no, it wasn't me." Uh, that there, there was there was a writing there was you know drawings in my science textbook when I had got it, which of course there had been, but I had added to them, and and that's the truth. Anyway, and my mother said you'd you'd added the boobies. I I, I drew a little dog. It was like supposed to be a sad dog, but actually, as you, as you as you proceeded with it, it got more booze. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, my mother also said, you know, there was. And a nice Christian boy wouldn't write that. And we had a Jewish science teacher. And so she then accused me of being anti-Semitic. And then some boys tried to beat me up at the water fountain when standard six. And of course I beat, I fought back. And then they had done a handwriting test. And for some reason, the what? day they did the handwriting test, and I didn't know they were doing this handwriting test, by the way. And so, you know, I, I've Entrapment. got- yeah, exactly. But, but it's entrapment. But I have this like Jekyll Hyde thing going on because I'm really a good guy deep down who does bad things occasionally. But I'm actually not really this good guy. So we had, our, and I remember the day, and it was like, we want you to write out your favorite poem. Well, I'm not going to write out my favorite poem 
in anything but my best handwriting. So I used my best handwriting to write uh, out the poem, which was The Highwayman, which is a poem that I loved at the time. And of course, the handwriting didn't compare all of a sudden. And it, I had this beautiful, gorgeous handwriting for the poem, and there was a slob who'd been writing in the science textbook. So that's the truth. It was actually my fault. I had done it. But I, and I am not, and am not, and have not ever been anti-Semitic. And um, I've, in fact, I'm saving up to be Jewish. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, they were. They said we, you know, we don't think your son is a good fit for the school. We'd like him to leave. So did you get expelled for uh, the drawing or for the fight? I got. It was. I got suggested that I leave the school. Ah, same. And then same. our priest said. Uh, said he had an affiliation with St. Andrews and Bloemfontein, and he suggested that maybe that it would be a good fit for me to go to boarding school. So mm. at the age of 13 or so, I went to boarding school in Bloemfontein. Yeah. And did that make you better or worse? Or It was terrible, man. It was terrible. Like, you know, it's funny because everyone wants to claim you, uh, you know, when you've done anything. Did you say, sorry, sorry. Did you say in Bloom? Yeah. Oi, Bloom is, okay, that's hectic. It was really hectic. And, you know, and um, the racism was deep then, and especially in the mm. free state. I mean, I probably still is. I don't know. I mean, you know, um, but I think at the time you weren't allowed to, if you weren't white, you weren't actually allowed to be, unless you had, you know, the correct documentation, you weren't allowed to be there between sundown and sunup. So if you were Chinese or Indian and you hit mm. the border, you had to keep driving until you got across there in the daytime. You know, it was a, it was a strange time in the world. Cheers. Let's, then, let's drink. Nine thirty. Cheers. <laughs> Tell me. Uh, and so, how did you get into production? I mean, I, I, I see that you. I mean, was it controversial to work with Winston Mancuco, for example, at that time, or not really? Or I know you did stuff with Robin Ald. Um, um, I had no idea what to do. So I went to. I had no idea what to do with my life. So. At the age of um, eighteen, I had I had been. I'd, I'd been to university for one year. Uh, I went and studied. What were you studying? I went to study music composition, and uh, my professor, Professor Clatso, was the music professor there. And for some reason, this is you know, it's another one of those strange things. I wasn't really qualified to go to music school, but I'd gone down to uh, UCT and I'd gone and had a meeting with Professor Clatso. And he had said to me, he had said something, and I said, I play the French horn, but I don't have a French horn. But blah, blah, blah. And somehow he sensed that I was going to be okay. So he let me in, uh, he let me enroll to the music school, but I, I really wasn't, I really wasn't qualified. And, and I struggled enough. Um, but he still saw something, and I'll tell you something funny. I've got hold of Clatso. He's still in Cape Town. I don't think he's in the best of health, but he's still in Cape Town. But I got hold of him, you know, maybe ten years ago or something like that, or whenever, whenever Facebook kind of kicked around and you started seeing new, you know, faces. And I sent him a message. I said, "Hi, it's me." And he said to me, you know, he sent me a message. He said, "Of all of the students that have been here, I remember you so well." And I have to apologize because we weren't ready for you. And huh. that was a, like a weird thing to say. And, and I don't know quite why he said that or what he saw or what I did that he saw that. But in any case, I didn't stay there long. I stayed there for a year. And then I went to the SABC to work as an engineer. And, um, and I wanted to work in radio. I didn't want to work in television. And back then, so I joined the SABC in must have been 1979. Back then, television was just sort of um, gaining traction in, in South Africa. And uh, But I, I wasn't interested in, the, in, in television. I was interested in sound. I wanted to work at radio. So I went to work for um, the S SABC in, I think, I think it was 79. They have all and, those custom SABC SSLs already at that time. No, no, they had old Neves at that time. But right. they, had these, they had all these old Neves that were one, the wonderful old Neves that manufactured, and they had all of the stuff written in Afrikaans as well. It's it still, wasn't you know, were they still there, those? I want them. That's what I want more than anything. I want one of those. Yeah, um, they, they, uh, I think Jack White's apparently got one. Uh, I really, I mean, I'd love one of those. <laughs> in any case, 
I was there for a year, and in a year I made. I, I, you know, I'm I, I'm not meaning to sound like anything now because this is a whole you know another ball game. But in a year, I made great strides there. I, I mm. couldn't stand the um, the bureaucracy and the red tape of going of these guys that ran the place, and all the engineers were in a in a group. We all had to get there at eight o'clock, and then you assigned different radio programs, and then there was plastic and tape across the EQs in the middle of the console. Like, do not touch that part. Like, you know, mm. you have record and and voice and you know like just use the faders and um <laughs> and but for, for some reason early on i got the ear of of music of 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 music people so david lloyd who did ran all the classical programs then he asked me to do all of his packaging malcolm gooding asked me to do all of his packaging i did a lot of packaging for gresham and mm. so they then they just said to me, you know, and, and they didn't like me because if I was five minutes late, then it was, you know, and whatever. I had apparently had an attitude or something. But anyway, so these guys said we would like Kevin to do package our programs. So, uh, so you know, the, all of a sudden I was given a workload instead of hours, and it would be like you need to have all of these programs done by this time. And it, they, they were used, they were running a thing called the Automat at that time. So you would put the voice on and music, and then you put a low pulse frequency on, which would trigger off the ads and 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 stop the, the tape and align it for the next beginning. And after the ads were finished, the, this automatic low frequency tone on it would kick in the next thing in. So that's how it kept going, you know, without people operating it. So I had to make all these tapes. I ended up developing a system where I could do three programs at the same time. And I used to do them at double speed because everything would come in a tape at 15 IPS. So I would just record it at 30 IPS and just do it. And I would go in on a Thursday and Friday and finish a whole week's work in two days. <laughs> and they, no one. And I used to go in on my bicycle. And I had a studio, and no one, no one governed my hours. And and I could package the programs. And I, you know, everyone was happy. Lloyd was happy. Malcolm Gooding was happy. Uh, you know. I, I remained friends with Malcolm Gooding for a while after that. I'm still friends with Gresham. So uh, that's what happened. And then uh, and then after about, uh, as I recall, 13 or 14 months of being at the SABC, I'd been reading a James Mitch in a book called The Drifters at the time. And all, it was just all about young people going traveling and drinking wine and having sex and and long evenings chatting over glasses of, of red wine. And I thought, that's what I want to do. So I took what little money I had, which wasn't much because I just spent everything that I had on an entire vinyl set of Led Zeppelin records. And um, I took what little I had, which was about five or 600 Rand back then. And I went to Greece. I'd spent about a year paying off my ticket, as you did back then. And I flew to Athens. And anyway, I was in Europe for about three months, and I ended up going to jail in Holland. And uh, I, I, again, for innocuous reasons, I didn't have a ticket on a train. And then I was there over <laughs> over. You go to jail for that in Holland? We, we, uh, you know, we had it was called what was it? Dingon's Day, whatever. That was December sixteenth or whatever it was, something like December eighth or something like that. Well, it would have been December sixth or something like that because. I was in jail the day John Lennon was shot. And I heard wow. on Dutch prison radio that he'd been shot. So I went to jail for not having a train ticket, but it was a whole, um, uh, just a whole uh, a lot of errors happened. Like it was. Do you, a do you have a knack for making bad situations worse? No, I don't have a knack. No. It wasn't that at all. It was like by the time they'd got me the, to the train station, the South African embassy had closed. And the South African embassy was closed the next day because it was Dingon's Day, whatever it's called, Battle of Blood River Day, whatever the fuck it's called. And then it was the weekend after that. And then after the weekend was a Dutch holiday. So there was this long weekend there where I couldn't go to the South African because my parents had sent me money for Christmas to the South African embassy. So all I was doing was going to go and get it. And the truth is I actually went to the station master in Amsterdam and said, I'm going to go and get some money in uh, in in Amsterdam, but I don't have money to pay for the ticket now. Can can I pay for the round trip when I get there? And I swear they said sure, and they put me on the train. But mm -hmm. the conductor 
didn't get the memo or whatever. And by the time I got to The Hague, which is where the embassy was, there was a there were police waiting for me and they arrested me and they took me to the police station to book me. And then they drove me to the South African, uh, South African embassy in the back of a van, which closed. And then they took me back to jail. So I went to jail and it was totally unexpected. Like it was, you know, it was like I wasn't, I didn't have, I didn't have any, uh, any, N negative headspace about life. I, I was. I had. I remember, I had a little green Bible in my top pocket. I mean, I was reading the Bible. Not that I was a, a devout religious thing, but I was finding it interesting to read the Bible. You know, when you're 19, 20, you know, but one day I'd read, you know, Tolkien, and the next day I'd read the Bible. I mean, you think you're cleverer than you really are. So um, <laughs> I read the Bible, and and then all of a sudden I got thrown in jail, and then they checked out, and they have a strange law in Holland where they can arrest you. If they suspect that you're going to commit a crime, and it goes back to the the, the Indonesia times, and it's it's how, it's how do they keep troublemakers off the street? So there was like, you know, this ridiculous thing. And when I came out of um, the jail, uh, I had called my mom. It was their wedding anniversary on the 12th of December, and so they kicked me out of the country. I drove around in a van for. Better, better part of a day on the last day and they took me to Rosenfontein and they said you have a visa for France now fuck off and they sent me down to are we allowed to swear on podcast yeah absolutely okay it's so then they, anyway, they sent me down to France and by the time I got to uh, you know wherever it was Brussels or wherever it went through in Belgium I got off the train remember having a bacon and egg sandwich at four in the afternoon and a beer to go with it and I called my mom and dad to wish them happy wedding anniversary. And then I burst into tears and my mother said, of course, well, come on home then. And so I said, okay, fine. And then they bought me the ticket to come home, which I was like, after the, you know, after I'd um, sorted myself out, I wasn't actually really ready to stop traveling. But I got to the airport in, in South Africa and there was music playing on the speakers. And I heard Highway Blues by Falling Mirror. and uh, I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to make records. And it's funny because that record really was the trigger point. And then I had to find out who it was. And then I found out it was a South African artist, which I didn't know. Why not Shazam it? <laughs> 1979, <laughs> 1980. And then I found out it was uh, Falling Mirror. And then I found out it was Tully. And then I called Tully's studio and uh, at Spaced Out Sounds. And there was a wonderful old eccentric uh, gay guy there called Alex who made sure I sent him a picture before he talked to me anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then he was super excited for me to come down because I was uh, just 19 years old and, you know, all, all, all ready to go, you know? And, um, so, uh, you know, I, I spent one night down in, uh, in, at, in Cape Town in Alex's house with him chasing me around in his underwear. And then I went to live on the beach for a while because, it was ludicrous. And Tully, of course, had no idea that I was coming to interview for a job. So I mm. sat in the room all day long waiting for Tully, and he finally came in. He had just recorded Leslie Ray Dowling's The Spaniard the night before, and he'd been up all night. And uh, uh, and so that's the day when I got there. It was uh, January 1980 or January 81 or something like that. And um, And that's when I started working with Tully. So Amazing. Is, it a, is, that, is that a long-winded and boring story? Absolutely not. I mean, this is all... I didn't, I didn't even know you had a whole world here before you were there. So this is all great. Oh, yeah. I, I want to read you something, if you don't mind. Um, Theo Kraus sent me this yesterday. It says, I learned everything about producing and engineering from watching Kevin. We've been friends for 24 years. Yur, that's long. Or Yur, that's long. He got the work ethic of a com he's got the work ethic of a comrade's runner. He actually cucked on me last month for probably 30 minutes for smoking. I love him. He's such a caring guy. Things I love most is he always has time to give advice but always talk cuck because I mostly call him to talk cuck, but I think it just gives him an opportunity to swear in Afrikaans. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's funny cuz Bobby Summerfield has just moved down the road from me here. And we made first we made our first record together in 1982, a Jaluka record in in Cape Town, and um, so we've known each other for nearly 40 years now, 39 years. Although he wow. still is just 25, 
but um uh so I get ample opportunity to swear in 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 as many languages as I choose now. So, yeah. but no, he's a he's wonderful, and uh, and Theo is a very talented guy, very talented producer, and a great musician. And and um, I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that I, not sure that I was ready for the Nude Girls when I did their record. I think in retrospect, I could have had. I mean, we had so little time. It was. Um, an odd time it was we were in uh, up in bop somewhere in a studio in bop and it was weird living in this place in this you know the studio it was just a strange place and i think uh and i didn't know them at all i knew i had heard bubble gum on my boots i think uh, oh i think is that what the song was called yeah um that's the only thing i'd known of them and i didn't know how how diverse they were and how um eccentric they were and i think had i known that there would have been a lot more to come out of that you know and and i'm and when i say i say that in a good way so i you know i think i probably went in treating them like i was doing another aerosmith record when really i should have been doing like a midnight oil or a talking heads record or something there were too many you know interesting influences going on there we i didn't have enough time to find out who they were really and what they were about so I still yeah. think that uh, Giant Love Affair is one of the most overlooked great songs and production ever. It's such a, like, uh, that little drum fill into that chorus is like fucking knockout. Uh, and it didn't, I never thought it got the recognition it deserved. That moment. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe yeah. there's a time for it. My whiskey's running low and yours. I've got a, yeah, all right. Time to refill. It's morning though. You're just pretending, right? You've probably got tea in there. Yeah, does that you want, <laughs> smell it? Smell it. Look, Kev, I, I've been so excited to talk to you, and that, uh, that's why this is I, I had to do this properly or no, not at all. I hope I'm not disappointing you. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Um, I want to ask you another question that that uh, th okay, I want to talk more about like, let's start with the nude girls. So just get, okay. tell me because there's the two parts, okay, everything I know is just like legendary in the in the back line. I, I've watched from afar. But first of all, there was the the Surpass the Powers album that you did. But then there was, I think you did the other absolutely like fucked up album, like probably the most fucked up nude girl. Well, didn't you do Relaxor? I think so, yeah. And that was like, it felt from a fan perspective to be just complete drug-induced madness. Like the album makes no sense at all. Do you remember so that I, album? I may, I may have only mixed that one. Oh, so I mean, I've only mixed that one. I only I came to South Africa only once and produced them. Theo came to me a couple of times and he brought me, I think, a band called Prime Circle. Is that a South African band? Yes. He brought me a band called Prime Circle to mix and some other stuff that he'd mixed and had a budget for. Right. Um, and uh, I think that they may have recorded one of them on their own. I don't, honestly, you know, I'm sorry okay. that I don't recall better. You know what? If I had the records in front of me, I might even. Okay. I've got know. a better question for you. And this one also comes from Theo. It says, you have to tell me about the first Rush album. The, the Rush album that I did? Yes. Oh, uh, you see, these are big, these are big human stories. So <laughs> I'll tell you, I mean, uh, so I, I was living in New York City and I had a three year old son and I was a single dad. Um, his mom had decided uh, there were other people, other way, other people to be with. My work ethic was a little bit serious and has never stopped, but I'm a, I'm a hard worker. And um, so I was living in New York. I'd gone to New York to try and make my fortune. I'd had a few op few opportunities come up. And um, is this, and sorry, I, is this post silver chair? Because I the silver no, chair no, also pre, pre silver chair. This is nineteen. This is nineteen ninety one. Hmm. And so um, I had a three year old son, and I was living on my own. I was living in a in a residential hotel, and I had no money. And I wouldn't. I was too proud to tell anyone. I was too proud to tell my parents. I was too proud to tell anyone. In fact, my sister got married, and I said I couldn't come to the wedding because. Um, I was busy, but I didn't have any money to get a ticket back from the states, and she was, and um, so I couldn't, I couldn't, didn't go to my sister's wedding, and we were so poor. How poor were you? No, I, we were so poor <laughs> that um, 
I, one month I had eight dollars, and there was a, a supermarket called um, uh, the Pioneer, and they had a special on spaghetti for three packs for a dollar. And I remember going to spend all eight dollars on twenty-four packs of spaghetti, and then we would go to the McDonald's on Seventy-second Street and Broadway, and we would steal all the ketchup and. In my residential hotel was called the Alcott Hotel on West 72nd Street, right next to the Dakota where John Lennon was killed. We stayed in this residential hotel. And the, and the manager of the hotel was a guy called Lee Rosen. And, man, he let me live there for a month without, for a year without paying rent. And I would go to him and say, Lee, I just don't have it. And he would say, it's okay. You, I know you're good for it. And he let me live there for a year. So we wow. had this like absolutely psycho situation where I had an apartment in New York with a balcony overlooking Central Park. We had two bedrooms or maybe maybe it was one. I think it was one bedroom, but we had a living room and a bathroom. And we had television and we had hot and cold water and we had heat and we had AC. And we had a doorman. So I had an address and we had a phone. And I had no money, and I was in this residential hotel, and I had enough to sustain us, like to not make us homeless. And this angel from heaven, Lee Rosen, um, just said, "Okay, I, I know you're going to be good for it." And and so one uh, one, so I'm borrowing money to get CDs out, and this guy. Jack Ponty, who was one of the original founding members of um, Bon Jovi, he had heard the Baby Animals record that I did in Australia in 89. And he loved that. And he said to me, and I was sending out, thing, you know, guess way before email, sending out messages saying, you know, can blah, 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 blah. And he said to me, send a CD to Peter Collins. He's about to do the Rush album and he's looking for an engineer. So I sent a CD to Peter Collins. I borrowed some money. I put together a showreel and I sent some uh, the CD to Peter Collins, and um, uh, Peter Collins had done Gary Moore at that point, which was big, it was, I, which I thought was an incredible sounding record. I think I forget what the song was. It wasn't uh, 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 Wild Frontiers. I think might have been the name of the album or something like that. But it was a huge record, and um, and I knew that he'd done some Rush albums before. And he also, his first big hit was Pass the Duchy on the left-hand side. That was his Peter Collins first <laughs> big hit. Anyway, oh, wow. so I spoke to Peter on the phone and he, get, he said, yeah, the lads in Rush would like to meet you. So I said, okay. He said, so we've got a ticket for you from New York City up to Toronto. Um, come up on the fr you know Friday afternoon, come up to the studio and say hi to the guys. So I said, fine. So I, I really didn't have any money. When I say I didn't have any money, I mean I didn't have any money. So I, you know, I had organized someone to babysit my son and um, Josh. And um, she had said to me, I have to go to a wedding on Friday night. So, you know, I need to leave by five. I said, look, I've got the three o'clock flight back. So even with traffic, I should be, you know, I think we'll, we land at three o'clock. I should be back by four o'clock or something like that. No worries. Anyway, went up to the meeting, had a meeting with Rush. and. Uh, they said, well, lovely, you're the first guy we've seen. We're going to see about another 10 people. We'll call you in the next couple of weeks. And then I said, great, terrific. And then I went to the airport in Toronto and um, heading back to New York City. And the security guard stopped me and said, you're not coming back into the U.S. And I said, they said, you don't have any money, you know, an ongoing ticket. You don't have permanent residence. You don't have anything. It's like, we, we can't let you back into the United States. I said, but my son's in New York. And I said, wow, that's it. Well, no yeah. So I was standing at the border in Toronto, a three year old son, and I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know what to do. I had no money to do anything. And um, I walked back up the hallway from immigration back into the airport. And there was a, a, a phone on this, on the wall, um, you know, like a, coin phone, whatever you call them. And um, I I didn't know who to call. So I called the Rush people. And I, they were still in the studio. And I said, hi, it's me. They said, hey. Um, and I said, put me through to the 
Peter, and then I got through to Peter Collins. I said, look, do you want me to make this record? And he goes, oh, Cape Man. Um, as he talks like that. He goes, Cape Man. Um, well, we haven't made up our mind yet. We've still got about another 10 people to interview, and we'll probably be with you in two or three weeks. We'll let you know how we go. So I said to them, well, I've got a little situation at the border here, so I'm either going to get on a plane to Australia, um, or you have to let me know if you can, if, if, in which case I won't be able to make the record. So, you know, maybe you should. He said, all right, let me go and talk to the guys. He said, I'll call you back on this number in 20 minutes. So I'm standing at the call box <laughs> in the hallway of, uh, the, on the walkway between immigration and Toronto airport. And a flight attendant from the morning flight walked by and she said, hey, hi. I remember you from the flight this morning. I said, hi. She said, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm not doing that great. And I explained the situation. And I said, I'm just waiting for a phone call. She said, oh, you know what? I'll hang out and I'll wait and see how you go, you know? And um, you got a lot anyway. of angels, bro. Oh, man. I tell <laughs> you. Anyway, Peter called me back. He goes, okay, the guys have decided to give you a chance. <laughs> so I said, well, there's another problem. He said, what is it? I said, I need some money. He said, how much money do you need? I said, well, I need to get an apartment. I got to get my son. I said, I need maybe $5,000. He said, okay. And then I got off the phone and Catherine gave me her address. And um, uh, Catherine was, she waited for me. And then she said, um, you can come, you want to come, you can stay at my place tonight. It was starting to snow. It was early February, 92. It was starting to snow. So she said, you can come and stay at my place tonight. So I went to stay at her place tonight. It was a Friday night. She was going to a party. The next morning, eight o'clock in the morning, I met Peggy Ciccone, who was the, the uh, Russia's manager. And she brought me $5,000 in a brown paper bag, literally. <laughs> and um, I called somebody who, uh, his name was Peter, and I don't remember the rest of his name. But <clears throat> he had wanted to be my manager. And I had asked him, so long story short, he flew up with my son. I paid him most of that $5,000. Uh, probably 3000 I think, for the air ticket and to fly himself up and back. And then I rented a little apartment on Young Street with the rest until we were due to start the record. And um, that was the rush story. That's unbelievable. I mean, how stressful and, to get you. How, so this stranger just flew to New York, picked up your kid, put him on a plane, and flew back to you. Yeah. Unbelievable. How That's old is Josh now? Crazy. Josh is 33 now. And what does he do? Josh is, uh, he's uh, like a graphic designer. He does all sorts of things. He's a bit of, um, you know, jack of all trades. Cool. Yeah. What a way to get started. I mean, uh, yeah. you, you, you know, you, you could have been a bullshitter and you strong-armed them into giving you the job. Well, that's right. And so then after that job finished, um, so that was the end. That was we, we finished in about June '92. My son's birthday was on January sixth, uh, June the sixth. So he turned four, and just after his fourth birthday, I have a picture of us. We went to New York. We have a picture of us with Billy Squire and Leon Zervos, and we all went out for bite for drinks. Those guys were good to Josh back then, and then we flew back to Australia, and uh, and um, I have found a little apartment. I decided that was the United States for me. I was done. And I found a little apartment, you know, maybe a mile from where I am right now, overlooking the beach. It was like $1,000 a month. And I was like, I'm happy. I'm happy to be a medium-sized fish in a small pond rather than fucking fight it out there. I mean, I didn't want to fight it out with the Americans at all. Can I just ask you, the, the, the rush experience, was it very hectic and competitive and stressful? Or was it very chilled and, and cool? That kind of led you to go, I'm done with that part of the world. Well, I had done that before. I mean, America had already said to me, we don't want you here. So I right. was like, you know, I'd done. And I didn't want to fight anymore. I didn't want to. This, I, didn't, mm -hmm. I had spent a year out of work. And I had a, you know, and I was driven to do this, to do this job. I wanted to do this job. I didn't know what else to do in life. I wanted to make records. I wanted to be in the studio. And I still love it every day, just as much every day. And I have. You know, absolutely, I get up in the morning at 3 in the morning and I have stuff to do because I love it so much. And I love my job. I mean, I love making records. And I still, you know, I still 
you know, uh, it's nice going back over 40 years and listening to some stuff because there are a few records that I really am very happy with the way they've come out and a few mixes. So I had somebody in here yesterday playing piano and he said to me, you know, what's the favorite mix you've ever done? Or what are the favorite mixes you've ever done? And I'm like, I don't know. And I went through them and, you know, there's a Zeppelin mix here and an Aerosmith mix here and a Black Rose mix here and a Journey mix here. And, you know, they've had number one records with these ones. And so, you know, and those things are gratifying, you know, but I still, every day I get into the studio, it's like I'm starting from scratch. I just feel like, you know, I mean, am I going to be able to coax any kind of, you know, emotion out of any kind of feeling out of these tracks that I've been working on forever? And I, and I, and I do work hard at them, you know. I, 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 try, I put in more time than ever then. And... Um, What's your yeah. mixing process then? Uh, how do you paint with with production? How long do you take on a track, or, or what do you look for? Well, I, what I look for is what I'm trying to convey. Firstly, am I trying to convey um, happy, sad, energetic, relaxed, angry? Uh, um you know it, it, the emotion plays a big part in it and um and i'm not technical enough to apply myself without bringing my emotion into it and i remember i mixed a band once uh, I did the movie Armageddon. I mixed did the soundtrack for that. And after that, I mixed um, a band who I'd mixed their singles called Starseed, which was on their band called Our Lady Peace from Canada. And um, and they came to New York and they finished up a record and they asked me to 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 finish their record. I I got stories. It's just stories. So I hope that's okay. But um, that's, that's the nature of of the show. Yeah. So I had. Um, <laughs> I was working with this band called um, Our Lady Peace from Canada. And I came in one day into the studio in New York and they were ready for me and I was in it. I had whatever mood I was in. I was in an hour. Maybe I was arrogant. Maybe I was in a foul mood. I don't know. But the song for the day was like a very Bon Jovi-esque ballad. And I just thought, I don't fucking feel like mixing this today. I mean, I don't feel like schlock today at all. So anyway, I put the song up. And I decided to make it all spiky and cranky and brittle and and everything. And I just I took all different elements in it. And you wanted to I kill thought, it, huh? You were trying to kill it. I wasn't trying to kill it. I was trying to I was trying to wrestle it into something else, you know. And um, right. Anyway, so um, I I was mixing it, and then the producer, I think his name was uh, maybe Arthur Lanny or uh, someone like that, came in. And the, the singer was Rain, and they came in, and they said, what are you doing, you know? And uh, it was like, well, I'm just having a go at this song and trying to make it a bit different. They went, and they said, well, it's really not how the song is meant to go. You know, the song is, it's a, it's a ballad. It's a whatever. So um, anyway, I said, look, let me just finish this. And you know, this, I mean, I must have been, you know, beyond arrogant because I said, let me finish this. And I will do it again for you. And I won't charge you for the day or anything else. But just let me do it again. We're ahead of schedule. If I've got a day in hand. I'll do it. But I'd like to finish this off. And so they were like, ugh, this guy, you know, fucking punk. And then we came to, the, at the end of the song, they had this little recorded bit. And they had this young girl singing, everybody day, every day. My Jesus is calling me. Some song like that, that re they'd recorded this little girl singing. So I put it in at the end of the song, and, and, and the guy, the producer came in, and he said, we don't want that thing at the end of the song. I said, oh, I think it sounds killer. And um, anyway, they just walked out. They shook their head. It's like, this is this fucking dick. And so anyway, I finished up the song, and I walked out the studio. And Rain and his girlfriend then at the time, Chantal, um, Kravuziak, Kravuziak, a Canadian, she's a great singer. Um, they were standing there and they were crying. And I was like, what's going on? And it was a really weird um, vibe. Anyway, the little girl who'd sung that had just been killed. And it was like, you know, it was like what, goose, 
goosebumps all up and down. You're like, you know, that's crazy, you know. Anyway, we left the song and we came back to it at the end and I mixed it just the way they wanted. It was like, it was an, it was almost like an exercise in humility that day for me, you know, and I was like, you know, just sort your shit out. So I came back and I mixed it just the way they wanted it, to rich pianos and et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, they chose the spiky mix with the girl at the end. And if you go and listen to the song, it's called The Thief. I think it's called Thief on one of their records. Um, you'll hear the mix and that little girl at the end. And so it's just funny. What is your process? Uh, you know, emotion plays a big part in how I deal with things. And, and you know, the artists that I work with now are generous enough to accommodate me. And they will, they you know, as somebody like Joe Bonamassa, well, he'll come in and he'll say, you know, I'll have, I know what songs we're working on. He'll say, what do you want to cut today? Like, All he's right, the artist, cool. but he lets me dictate what we cut. And if I'm not in a mood for something, we don't go there. And it's not arrogant wow. and it's not anything. It's just like, you know, he knows my work process and my thought process and how I get involved in stuff. And if you're not emotionally involved in it, it's just n not doing what it should. And it's not technical in terms of it's just these faders and it's the microphone and this knob. You know, it's about to, you know, when I'm, so, so it, what I'm saying is my production at the it's end of the day, process. it's a creative process, but you said, how do you, what your question was, how do you approach a mix? Hmm. So by the time I get to the mix of a song, I know where it's going and I know what it's supposed to feel like and sound like. And at the end of the day, sometimes it'll only take me an hour to mix a song because all of the work is done beforehand. Mm. Um, but mixing other artists, it's just different. It's just, uh, I just, it's, t you know, it's, I mean, I, I, I do a workshop and I try and teach people the basics of doing a mix. And I ha have a pretty, I, I think amazing methodology for people that are trying to get a mix together to follow. And I have people in here from uh, accomplished producers to rank amateurs, and they all leave with a pretty good mix under their belt. So the methodology is really good. But I don't necessarily approach that myself. I only use that method when I'm stuck. So, for instance, I did a live broadcast from a stadium in Melbourne a little while ago, and the monitoring was difficult. The record, you know, it was a really difficult situation. And I went back to my methodology in order just to get the so, basic mix going, and it came out sounding terrific, but it was right. really, you know, very, it's, this was one of those situations that, you know, you could have tied yourself into a knot over, you know, so. Um. I would love to, I mean, if you'd be willing. So I run, uh, I have this big recording studio in Johannesburg that is a free recording studio for, uh, it's, you know, one of the, there's a couple of problems in in South Africa. We don't have an infrastructure for the music industry. So it's this big studio with an SSL, uh, world-class facilities. And the idea is that it's for emerging artists. We do training sessions. We do workshops. Um, we're very like tough love. We We're not about like, fucking about in the studios you book time you arrive on time you work with the engineer we host master classes all the time and i would love for you to even virtually if 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 that would be a way to do it to get you involved somehow and, and one of the things you brought up which i love is just the idea that one of the things i've my experience with working with producers and mixers in south africa is that it's about uh, like uh, and it's it's different when I work when you work with amazing people like yourself. The approach is different. Whereas there's some sort of misconception that mixing or production is about like levels, you know, like uh, you know feedback is generally like oh I need more vocals on that or and, and the the fact that you approach your mix is sort of like a painting that you're actually creating something out of what you you're given. I think that's something that is 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 uh not understood here and that why the way you've explained it really illustrates that as well like that you're creating something with what you've got you're not just putting the levels in the right place yeah I, um yeah uh 
Although I do tend to think, and I, you know, I, I, I do tend to think that, you know, at the risk always of sounding, you know, fucking up my own butt, but um, I do tend to think though that if you if that's the way you approach it, then you're probably really, you know, you're probably an engineer, and there's no harm, and and there's not only not no harm to that. There's a lot of like just being a uh, just being, you know, there. There are great engineers that are not producers. You, they are not, mm. you know, not interchangeable. And you know, Al Schmidt just died at ninety-one years old. One of the great engineers of all time, and he never really claimed to be a producer. I mean, he produced this record and that record, but he really was an engineer. He was involved with Sonics. He was involved with sound. You go, you know, you get people like Bob Clearmont, who's probably the best mixer in the world for my, you know, for my dollar, and he's not a great producer. But he found out where he is really great. So, you know, I don't know that everyone is a producer. I don't think everyone should aspire to be a producer. I don't think engineering leads you to be a producer. I think, you know, one of the things I disliked mostly was the the credit where you have produced and engineered by because I don't I think they're mutually exclusive uh, jobs. You know, I don't think they're the same things. And I'm not a producer that's involved in the level. I don't. I could give a shit if you ask anyone who I record with. I don't care which microphones we use. I don't care if there's distortion on them. I don't care if the levels are low or hot. I really don't care at all. At the end of the day, it's about getting the performance. And the performance for me, the artist and the song are the most important thing. And if I have any influence over either of those, then that's what I do as a producer now. My job as a producer also, and and this is you know a little more than just emotion. When the different artists that you work with require a different set of skills uh, for each one. So, for instance, when I'm working with Iron Maiden, I don't go in and say, "Look, you know, a six-minute galloping intro without vocals is not not you know conducive to be successful. It's certainly not going to you know." twig the algorithms of TikTok. So let's change that. You can't fucking do that. That's how they make records. That's the music that they do. So you have to, you go along with that. You say, you know, this is what you do. I'm going to capture what you can do to the best of your ability. And, you know, one of the things that I think is a hallmark of my uh, producing style is that my artists sound like themselves. And, you know, when Mutt, who I... I have in, in, immense love and affection and admiration for makes records that sound like mutt. I mean, whether he makes yeah. Def Leppard records or Barbra Streisand mm -hmm. records or Air Supply records or whoever he's making records for, they sound like mutt. And but and can I just challenge you on one thing? That yeah. that thief that thief story you told me. Uh, what, yeah. what were you there, a producer or a mixer? Uh, I was a mixer. So I was, but, I was, yeah. I was getting about, I was getting too full of myself. I was above my station, but it worked out that day. Right. But that wasn't my position. There was a producer. I think his name was Arthur Lanny. I think that was his name. He was the producer, and he'd come in and said, "I wanted a different way." And truth be told, I gave it to him the other way as well. It just that my take on it had, mm. you know, it went on influencing them. But if you listen to my records, you go and listen to Aerosmith, go and listen to Maiden. Go and listen to Silverchair. Go and listen to the Black Crows. Go and listen to Aerosmith. Go and listen to Zeppelin. What do they sound like? They sound like those bands. They don't sound mm. like there's no Kevin Shirley sound in there. They sound like those bands. There's reverb all over Journey's record that we had a number one hit with in 1996, and yet Silverchair in '95 is full of brittle distortion and 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 no reverb. And you know, so my job is really, you know. Um, trying to ascertain what it is in the band. And, you know, it's interesting. Take a band like Journey. <clears throat> when I went to work with them in 96, they had been broken up for about 10 years at that point. And one of the things that I had to do, we ended up uh, being in um, in uh, pre-production for six weeks, which, by the way, infuriated them. But I was kind of adamant. I made them play together for six weeks to find their groove. And then... You know, or I listened to their records and I found out all the hallmarks of their success and where what they were doing that was so cool and what they'd lost on the way. And so when we went to go make that record, it was like 
when you guys do a signature and if you play the piano and do the guitar or doing the same part, that's become a journey signature. And then, if, then if, you know, Neil Sean would be, fuck, man, I don't want to do that. But it would be like, as soon as he put, as soon as you did that, it just sounded like journey. And yeah. that's what everybody wants to hear. They lost their virginity to, um, to open arms. And <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, those are the records. Um, I don't know that they're that well known outside of the United States, but, but you know, these, are. Records, these records are huge. Um, and, and you know, sold a hundred million records, these, these, mm. these guys, you know, so, you know, you have to go and work out what it is that the bands need as well. And, um, and, and yeah. Hmm. And what about, uh, I mean, the silver chair adventure must have been quite a, quite a thing. I remember that so clearly first hearing silver chair and, uh, I mean, I just remember saying on radio every time, this is a band of 16 year olds managed by their mother. What was the mother like? <laughs> uh, they were 14 year old. Oh, uh, <laughs> they were 14 year old. That was 19, uh, 1995. Um, um, I mean, crazy good album that was crazy. Yeah, you know, I just did a, a silver chair podcast. And for somebody who's never listened to podcasts, I've done a, a fucking lot of them, but I've, um, I've never heard a single one in my life. But um, uh, I did a silver chair podcast last uh, a couple of weeks ago, or a Daniel John's podcast, and um, you know the thing the thing is, and time erases all these things. But my memory on some of these things is clearer than most. But I had three fourteen year olds in the band in the in the studio who didn't. Who I think the drummer had only been playing for about a year, and. I know I made that record. I know I made that record literally handcrafted. I mean, if you'd come into the studio when we were cutting it and we were cutting it on, on two inch tape, 24 track tape, I had uh, like uh, uh, stalactites hanging from the ceiling of little tape cuts where this fill is good, this fill is good, this fill is good. Oh, so you I'd were building drum tracks. Building drum just, tape building drum and, drum then, drum. and then overdubbing the guitars and you know, Daniel came in with a pink Ibanez Steve Vai edition when he first came in. And I was like, you know, that guitar is not going to fly. And oh, so I. With the horrible Floyd Rose Trevolo. Yeah. And I had a convention old, of all guitars. Exactly. I had a 1955 uh, Gibson Jr., mm. uh, which I brought in for them to play on that Ooh. record. I said, play this. Nice. And, you know, and so. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I know that I made that record. And then. The funny thing is that, you know, time is funny, but I remember after the first record and when they moved into the second record, and this is a long story. I mean, they, but they basically moved on from me. Um, and uh, they basically moved on from me. And then they badmouthed me for, for, for a bit. And then it was what, like. What did they say? You, you know, uh, that wasn't really re representative of what we were. Uh, that's you know he kind of coerced those performances out of us. He he made us sound like this. And it's so weird that f that that first album vibe that you, everyone forgets what actually happened in that space so quickly. I I, I know so it very well myself. Yeah, from my own so album. Often. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, yeah. but now they, so they now they don't remember that as well. Although it's in books, so. You know, these guys, there are people that have written books about them. And they found these newspaper articles, but they didn't have to badmouth me. They just needed to get on. If they didn't want me there, I mean, there is nothing dumber, in my opinion, than a successful first outing and changing personnel and changing tactic. And how many first records have you seen that with? So many. All, all of them. fucking second album, unless you main, can maintain and build, it's like these are the lessons that they need to learn. This is one yeah. of those ones that, you know, I I give Joe Bonamassa the deepest bow and the deepest tip of the hat to because he and his manager, Roy Weissman, they have this figured out. And, you know, they've come to me at some point and they go, look, you know, not every record is going to be a home run. And they talk in baseball, you know, uh, uh, in terms. Not every record is going to be a home run. But if we make it to the World Series, that's our goal. And if we can win the World Series, then that's our goal. So there'll be stumbles along the way, but they you grow and you learn and you grow and you learn. 
and you develop artists and they do that too. I mean, there have been records mm. I've done with Joe where he's just fucking checked out. Like he checked out before the recording and he didn't listen to them until they were, you know, well done. So, um, you know, the, I think that there is a tendency for, you know, labels are always, they're notorious for looking for, um, you know, Quickly. the next best thing. I mean, always, yeah. you know. Who just mm. made, you know, the Maroon 5 album? We got to get him. Or who just did this, like, rather than trying to understand what the artist might need or or how the artist might grow or whether there is growth or whether they can whether they can actually stomach, you know, two albums worth of growth to develop an artist. And, yeah, it's, uh, it's the way music has been most successful, Pink Floyd. I mean, you have all these, you know, things that they do in the early days. And then they have Dark Side of the Moon and Wish You Were Here that have sold forever and ever. The catalog of those things is more than some people's careers is just mm. those catalogs. And because, you know, they were allowed to develop. And and um, and it's, it's a very short-sighted industry. And now with, you know, streaming and Spotify and the algorithms that determine what song gets played in a choice playlist on Spotify or whatever, Apple Music or whatever it is, that's become even even worse. It's a happy mm. conversation, isn't it? No, I mean, it, it is what it is. I mean, the, the one thing that's sort of concerned, I think, as far as I understand, already Spotify's um, kind of succumbed to the major label pressure. Like, if you want to be featured on Spotify as an artist, you've got to still go through the major label channels and stuff. So even though I thought Spotify was going to be the great democratizer for for independent artists, it hasn't really worked out that way. I don't know if, if well, that resonates at all. Well, it doesn't resonate with me at all because, you know, any any of the little income that's coming in is not going to the creators of the music. It's going to the artists. And mm -hmm. if you want to take uh, producers out of being the creators of music, then then you're cutting off your nose to spite your face because, you know, uh, there's no question in my mind that what we do makes a difference. I mean, mm. for instance, there's a great artist here in Australia, Jimmy Barnes, and, um, you know, he's a, a, he's a great mate of mine. Um, but, you know, he we did a record, and he's been making records forever, and he's a national treasure here. But he, you know, they play certain size gigs. We did a record, his last solo record. We had a big hit single on it called Shutting Down Our Town. And he would book to play a 2,000-seater venue. That now sells out in five minutes. He ends up playing 20,000-seat venue at the, you know, at uh, the Rod Laver Arena. And one single makes that difference. Mm. One single on the radio puts bums on seats. And, you mm. know, we all know that th those these artists are making money from bums on seats, no one's making money from records. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to take the producer out of that equation, um, at, I wasn't you know, talking about the producer. I was talking about the the No, I understand. Of, I, yeah, well, yeah. What I'm saying is that none of that Spotify money comes back to the producers. So, yeah, 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 yeah. there is no money. People are looking at little what little tri trivial I, income that you're getting back from those things now, and they're going, "Well, we can't justify having." you know, spending this much money on a producer when we're only getting right. X amount for 1 million plays or whatever it is. So, right, 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 right. You know, I mean, you, you want me to drink whiskey? Fucking, that's, you know, that's what's going to happen. We're going to have, ra you know, rambling conversations. That's the point. Okay. <laughs> that's the whole point. Um, I don't have a lot more time with you, so I want to, I've got three more questions and I'll let you get on with your life. Steve Lowe, question mark. Steve Lowe. So he, yeah, he should be a national <laughs> treasure in South Africa. I this mean, is the problem. We we there are. Uh, it's one of my a, a lot of my career, a lot of the work that I do, including the studio that I that in in Newtown that I was telling you about, um, is focused on the idea that our our national treasures are not looked after, celebrated, respected in the way that they ought to. Um, and so a lot of the stuff I do on this podcast is I interview lots of big stars and then I pepper them with with guys like yourself or Steve or guys that I think that South Africa really needs to know more about about their part played in this space. Yeah, I mean, 
You know, I've known Steve since uh, the early 80s uh, when I played in a band called The Council in South Africa. Um, we had Brian Davidson singing for us. I played guitar. Steve was on the road with All Night Radio and Robin Old was on the on the circuit in Cape Town. It was quite a live and bustling circuit then. It was actually really fun. We used to play the same set of gigs. We used to play the Brass Bell and we used to play out in Belleville and we used to you know, play some couple of hotels. I've forgotten their names. <laughs> we used to play at Hot Bay Hotel. I mean, we had, you know, we had fantastic. I mean, they're just fantastic. Saturday afternoons at the Brass Bell in Cork Bay. I don't know if you've ever been there. But still, it's just, still, like, still going strong. It was dynamite. We, they used to give us some money, and then they used to give us some of the uh, percentage of the, of the alcohol sales. And we would go in there. We just had riotous Saturday and Sundays there. Or, uh, at the at the brass bell, it was fantastic, and um, and so Steve was playing with All Night Radio, and I knew him from back then, and um, then of course they did their record. Uh, I think the Heart's the best part, or something like that. The first one they did, yeah, with um, with John Rollo, an American engineer, who had some connection with Steve Van Zantel or Springsteen or something, and they did fucking killer record. I mean, you know, a killer sounding record. It was just like. South African records just didn't sound like that at the time. You know, we had, we just didn't have the technology and we didn't have the experience. We didn't have, you know, people that were making, I suppose, oh, you know, I mustn't be too condescending. I didn't mean to be because I think Rabbit were making fairly good records back then. I mean, I don't remember a lot of other great records back then, but Steve Loeb had maybe one of the best sounding records that got made. So, um, I knew him from then, and then I produced their album in 86 called The Killing Floor, I think it was called. Um, so I've known Steve from back then, and then he became Big Sky and Steve Lowe. And and, uh, and you've just done an album with him now? We've just done an album. We went to Nashville to make a record, and I got a bunch of the best musicians in Nashville around who have all become my friends over the years because I've, you know, I've lived in the States for a long time. And um, we got them all together. And Steve, you know, has Steve hasn't made a record for about ten years, so he's spent ten years like writing songs and and um, and you know he phoned me and he said I've got like a hundred songs, but I have twenty songs that I'm like I over and over and over and over, you know, um, I, I'm going them I'm going over them over and over and over. And I'm happy with the way they are. And I'm happy with the lyrics. And I'm happy with the message in them. And I'm happy with the music. So, you know, uh, can we make a record? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, when you have an artist that has that in them, you know, um, that's something else. Because I don't, especially these days, I don't deal with a lot of artists that are absolutely ready to go. You know, it, times have changed. I mean, when without... You know, times have changed from when you had the whole record written and pre-produced, and now you go into the studio. I don't know lyrics for this, and I'm thinking about this one for this thing for a chorus, and it's like, oh my god, it's so much work. But Steve was ready, and I knew I could go into the studio with musicians, and he's malleable enough in the studio. If I would say this, then he would go, okay, fine and old enough now and so we, I, you know we made a record and and uh and it's it's great and it's doing well it's i saw uh, you know the, the one single it's just got over a hundred thousand streams today brilliant on spotify and you know these are unheard of numbers for an artist that's living on a farm in middle of covid <laughs> lockdown you know and with no cool. with, with with no uh, exposure really or no he, you know he, he's not putting himself out there he's not a 20 year old anymore you know he's uh he's a wizened old gray head songwriter and um and and these are the best songwriters we have we should keep these guys going and we should honor them and we should i mean we should treasure them i mean i don't stop listening to dylan or john hyatt or you know, these are the guys that are writing the real songs, and mm. and that's the kind of stuff I love. So Steve's up there with them for me. I mean, 
you know. Do you still do you have a soft spot for working with South African artists or helping out back here, or is it not just really, you? not really to be honest? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's the whiskey, but no, not really. I mean, uh, that's the reason. Have, that's why the whiskey's so helpful. Yeah, get, get I haven't been there. For, I haven't been there for a long time. I went there to do the the one the, the Springbok New Girls record. And before then, I think I was the last time I was there was um, maybe eighty seven or eighty eight. So it's been a long time, you know. And I have family there, so I have family in Benoni, and my, my mom and dad are in Australia now. But um, I have family in Benoni still, and I obviously have friends there. Um, but it was a brutal society. I mean, you know, it's the, you know, growing up in the apartheid, growing up in the middle of it, growing up in the midst of it, growing up with our house in Lind Lindhurst overlooking Alexandra Township, mm. and 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 this great lie that was going on all the time that we, you know, it's 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 affected me deeply, and it affected me. Um, in so many ways, I mean, when when we when I was in school in the seventies, you know, we used to have people come to the school with um, from the Outspan Orange factory or Outspan Orange Works or whatever, and they would bring oranges to the school and these little orange like plastic doodles that you stuck in and you would drink the orange out of the. I don't know, you remember those things? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Cutting things that you put in there and you drink out of there, and it was like these are the best. What we have in South Africa, well, I think they called Capri Sun or something, weren't they? No, no, they were like it was like an orange. Uh, oh, an action, uh, like a spout, like that, a plastic spout that you stuck into right. the uh, into the orange itself, and you uh, you cut a, open a oh, hole. Oh yes, okay, now I know what you're you talking about. Out. There's probably a word for it, like the, you know, like the little thing at the end of the shoelace. Okay. But um, I get you. It's it's one of those things, and I remember they'd come to the shop to to the sh to the school with those things, and they'd bring us an orange, and you'd cut out the top, and then you drink it, and then they would say. These are the best oranges in the world. Outspan oranges are the best oranges in the world. Even though we have boycotts and sanctions here, this is the situation. That is the situation. We have the best cornflakes. We have wimpy burgers because we don't need McDonald's or whatever. So everything was different, but because it was better. And that mm. was the that was you know only one of the many multitude of lies that we were led to believe. But it's the one actually that actually finally resonated with me because. I went to Greece after I read this James Mitchell book, aforementioned James Mitchell book, and I walked into Monastiriki uh, Square, and there was a fruit barrow, and they had these oranges on there, and they were enormous, and I had never seen oranges that size before, and at, well now they're just standard oranges, but like I had never seen oranges that big before because all of the good fruit in South Africa was exported, mm -hmm. and what was left were the smaller oranges, whether they were tastier, whatever, I don't know what the story is, with the thinner skin. And so I, I, I remember being like shocked to see such big oranges and I thought they must be really shit. I mean, because we have the best, we have these small little oranges with the thin skin. And so I bought one of these oranges and it was unbelievable. And it was like, I'm like, why did they lie to us about oranges? What else did they tell me that wasn't true? Well, that's exactly right. Yeah. And why did they lie about the oranges? And then on it went, you know. And um, and I oh. called my. We, I saw um, I saw a news program in a bar on the same trip in in Athens, and they had been shooting in Soweto. And I called my mom. I said, "What's going on there?" And she said, "No, there's nothing going on here. Like you know, nothing's going on here." Past us is on the on the TV in the evenings, and and you know I've, I've seen it. I've seen those cars and those trucks going to Soweto shooting people. What the fuck's going on? She'd say, no, no, that's just you know propaganda that you're seeing there. That's not what's going on. And I remember, I remember, like, I'll tell you what I felt. I felt so stupid. I felt small. And I felt like I was the dumbest ass in the world for having believed anything that had been told. And it was like, you know, I felt like there was this fucking statue of Vut like over me. And I was just like, you know, w w w what has happened? What has mm. happened? How could you, how could you, you know, like, how could you treat people like this? How could you lie to us? How could you, 
you know, and all of these things came to me in a strange way. So I know it may sound insignificant, but this is how it, it finally doesn't. got through to me at all. This is how it finally got through to me. And, you know, it wasn't long after that where I was like, uh, my younger brother who was in the military and, um, and, and he was at Fort Rekker Hoogte and, uh, and, you know, they, they would go to these meetings at Fort Rekker Hoogte and then somebody would say, wie is die feyant? Wie is die feyant? And then they go, kafar is die feyant? Kafar is die feyant? And so my brother said, look, you know, I'm, I'm in the army, uh, you know, not to defend the status quo of the government. I'm here to defend the country. And he was terribly beaten up. He'd been in Angola. He'd been on those on those on those helicopters that gunned down kids in all the villages. He'd seen all that stuff. My brother's now dead, and he, you know, his PTSD lasted until the day he died. And And that's hard, you know. So, <clears throat> so to be honest, I don't have this huge gaping love affair for South Africa because I don't think it did me right, and I don't think it did a lot of us right. And I don't. And and this is rich coming from you know this is rich coming from the wealthy white boy who grew up in in the suburbs who went to the private schools. So, what about everybody else? It didn't do any of us right. This is, you know, this maltreatment of humankind just to to benefit these um, these um, these beliefs that they had is, you know, it's obscene and disgusting. And it's I and and I, you know, just as I don't believe the Japanese could come out of World War Two having before, you know, done these Japanese water tortures on people that all of a sudden be this like wonderful person next door or the Germans you know, with the Jews, and then all of a sudden, oh, it's all, all forgiven, and let's go back to the way things are. You know, it's all good and well to call it the Rainbow Nation, but you don't drag somebody who's black behind uh, the back of a bucky in the free state, and, and, and t so their limbs all come off while you're dragging them behind. And then two weeks later, it's determined this isn't the law anymore, so everything's going to be fine. So there's a, there's a mm -hmm. big disconnect for me in all of this. And, I, you know, I don't say these things aloud very often, and this is the whiskey seriously doing its work, but so no, I don't have this this great affection, and and um, I I try not to talk about it, and I try not to to um, to have it be forefront. But I you know um, you know it's so uh, I, I I you know I've loved a lot of things there. I loved living in Cape Town. I loved learning to work there. I loved learning. Um, uh, uh, you know about different cultures there. I loved working with with Winston Mankunku to go back to the early days. I loved, you know, that was an eye opener for me. Uh, with working with Paddy Lee Thorpe and he said Benza and work with Jonathan Butler, and to understand that people's skin doesn't actually determine the person, which we were kind of, you know, going to Bloemfontein <laughs> wasn't. I can promise you that wasn't an exercise in in uh hmm. in understanding so, firstly uh, i'm sorry about your brother um okay. and you know obviously i can uh, there's a lot of pain there Have you, uh, and that what i mean there's still this place is fucked up but it's come a long way since the 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 time you're talking about it and obviously there's no uh you know forgiveness or it's not it's not completely transformed but it's definitely not the same place now that is the one you're describing. No, I'm not, I'm not putting anything on your plate except to say it might be worth uh, a revisit at some point in your life to maybe put that pain behind you and just come and yeah. see what's going on down here. It, it, there's lots of problems, but yeah. there's a lot of progress, you know? Yeah. And, you know, and I, I do see that. And, you know, Obviously, when uh, Anthony Bourdain came down there and did the cooking shows down there and what you know all that stuff, it's fascinating. And you have there's a pang, and um, you know my plan is actually to come to bring my family to South Africa next uh, next uh, winter. Uh, go you know to go to the Cape and go to Okavango and uh, you know to show them the things that were important for me. I mean, 
I grew up going to the Kruger every three or four times a year. You know, that mm -hmm. was part of our thing, you know. My five-year-old says to me the other day, he says, when you lived in South Africa, did you have to hunt for your food? And I think, <laughs> I think a lot of people still think that about Africa. Yeah, especially in your neck of the woods. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to, I can't leave without, I know you must ha hate this question, but I, I can't leave you without asking about working with Aerosmith. You know, such... Uh, such love for that band, and I just want to know anything, any stories, or what it's like working with them. Uh, um, you know, it was uh, it was a tough record to make, and uh, it was a tough record to make because they'd already made it once, and um, they'd made it with another producer, and then the label wasn't happy. Um, and you know, there's a whole book in this story. I mean, uh, this you know this. I, I've got stories for every song and stories about every song. And, um, you know. Give me one. <laughs> I'll well, I'll tell you. I, it, one of the things that I think is, uh, one of the things I think is an attribute of mine is I have a natural compartmentalization process that happens to me. And I don't do it on purpose. Like I just, it just happens. And as soon as I get to be working with anybody, it just becomes work. So if there's Jimmy Page there or Paul McCartney there or You check your ego at the door. No, I don't check my ego at the door. I don't nothing is nothing as specific as that. I just compartmentalize. It just mm. becomes work for me. And uh and in everyone I try and hear how much better they could do. I don't go listen to something and I go, that's insanely good. I just go, you know, yeah, that's kind of cool. We could do it better, I'm sure. And mm. that's, I don't know if that's arrogant or whatever, but I, I have that when I'm making, when I'm in the studio with whomever. And I have that with Aerosmith. And I, you know, when I've gotten to the first pre-production with Room, Room with Aerosmith, I thought they were the most average band I'd ever heard. I mean, in pre-production, wow. they were just awful. And That's hard to know, fathom because they're, they, sound wicked on a record well absolutely and they are wicked and they are wicked but there was just something about that place we were at when we were going through songs where i was just like are you fucking kidding me mm. but um you know uh just one little story i mean we went through the pre-production period with them it wasn't it wasn't painless i could just tell you that it was it was not stephen didn't want to make the record at all and he had made that clear he didn't want to go in there. He is very happy. He'd made the record already with Glenn Ballard. He'd sat in the chair that Alanis Morissette had sat in. And he was such a big fan of Jagged Little Pill that he wanted to make a record like that. He wanted to make a Stephen Solo record, really. And and to be honest, that it probably is a record that he should have done because that country thing he did was such a piece of crap later. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, he should have made, like, that should have been the Stephen Solo record. But Columbia had just acquired them back from Geffen Records at a, I think it was something like a twenty million dollar deal at the time, which was a lot of money. And Columbia was not happy, and the band was not happy, and the A and R people were not happy. So you're and in a sticky situation here. I was in a sticky situation from the get go, and uh, and um, so we did pre production, and then we went to start cutting on Monday, and Stephen didn't come in. So on the first day of tracking, we cut. I said, well, Stephen's not here, but we're going to keep going. So we, we started with the band. We cut uh, Falling in Love is Hard on the Knees on the first day in the studio. We finished the whole track. We did all the overdubs. And um, Stephen came in on the Tuesday, and he was fucking livid. He was livid. He was like, how dare you make an Aerosmith record without me being here? I am fucking Aerosmith, like blah, blah, blah. And I just said to him, Stephen, I have a record to make. If you're not going to come along, what do you want me to do? It's like, if you don't come along, then yeah, I, I can't make a record. If you want to be on the record, then come along. I don't mean, I don't know what I'm thinking, but that's the way my brain works in these situations, you know? So, um, so he didn't miss another day after that, but he didn't, he didn't let it go easily. He was like, you know, he came on and I would give him a cassette of it. And I'm like, this is the track I've changed the arrangement. And he'd come back and say, fucking track sounds terrible. I was on the treadmill. I nearly fell over. But um, I'll tell you one interesting thing, South African related. One, me and Stephen. It's a had, great album, by the way. My kid is six. I mean, I put him onto it. That's all he listens to. Oh, Twenty-four hour days. That album. Thank you. <laughs> and there's some. Well, I, there's uh, there's a lot of 
big, big stories about that. And uh, um, I'll, I'll, uh, a lot of big stories about that. Listen to I the wonder. very end of the fade out on Hole in My Soul. Very end of the fade out. Okay, and what am I listening to? All I'm going to tell you is you're going to hear him saying, Good night, Taji. Good night, Chelsea. And then I'll tell you the story. I remember that. I ha okay, well, let me ask you a question. I'm going to let you go. But I've got one last question. Then I'm going to say, would you be willing? I know there's there's no obligation. Maybe yeah, we could do another that. show just about the air. I mean, maybe I could do a couple of these with you if you'd be keen. I've really loved chatting to you. And I feel like I haven't even scratched the surface here. Yeah, um, sure. Okay, I will I will email you a follow-up. I definitely want to do a second one. I definitely want to talk about that Aerosmith record. Sounds good. Okay, last question. And for and just want to say this has been such an honor for me, really. I've always I actually messaged a whole bunch of my friends who uh were very jealous that I got to speak to you. You're such a legend in South African uh like the the history of music here. Oh, um thanks. so I'm glad I got to connect. And that is can you recommend this is a bit of a, uh, you know, can you recommend someone for this show that you think might enjoy it? Someone who likes whiskey and likes to talk shit about stories. That's my final question. Maybe Nick Lorne. you like, who's Nick Lorne? That's what I'm, I was going to ask you, how do you spell that? That's how much I know him. Nick Lorne produced Sex, sex Pistols and Bin oh. Oil and him and I, I tell you what, if you want to have a, like a 99-hour podcast, Nick Lorne and I are the guys. We're the same age. Our careers have been like this. He's chosen all the cool bands and made no money, and I've worked with these other bands and made money. And uh, <laughs> But our, 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 our careers touch every occasionally. Silverchair, he's the guy who did the original edit on Tomorrow and – that that became the big single for them in South mm. in Australia. He did all those Midnight Oil records. Um, I don't even know the band so he works. I don't listen to that crud. <laughs> <laughs> so but I love would, it, would it be great good to have both of you on together or should I just spend a, a session with him, do you think? Oh, uh, you know. All right. Whatever I'll figure that you, one out. Whatever you want. <laughs> they're both they're both good. That would Kevin, be Dave, and Shirley, you you are legendary and really much appreciated and loved having you on What's Your Poison. And I will try to bug you. I know you must be busy to do another one with you. I've, I've got Steve up as well, coming up now as well. I want to do a whole show with him. And much, you know, respect and love and great to meet you. Thank you well, for your thanks, time. John. Thanks, John. And good luck with it all. And How's uh, that 15 year looking? Not too bad. We'll take it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, man, you go and have a, have a good day. I mean, you probably need a little lie down now. <laughs> yeah, this, this is, I'm going to regret this in at least 35 minutes' time. I've got a big day ahead, but it, it was well worth it for me. So what, thank what you. What SSL console do you have? Um, it's that 1984 um, no, like 6000E. 6000. Yeah, yeah so um, I love you. I've, got, I've got a 72 channel SSL here. Wow. Yeah. That's you huge. Want to see? Yes, There's please. 72 channels of SSL. Wow. That's a lot. That's too many channels. That's about at least 12 channels too much for anyone to actually use, right? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I had 48 for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and I kept just being compromised so much. And, um, mm. And I, you know, I, I love working analog. And so I don't, I'm not one of those guys who has any plugins. Like, yeah, I just, you when, if you look at my, you know, people like what plugins you go, it's like, I don't have any plugins, like, like literally. You know what I have at the moment? We haven't done it yet. We, I've managed to get the Harrison that Graceland was recorded on. Oh, and we wow. want to rack, we want to rack mount it for, for the drums it, and then from there into the SSL. That's our next plan for the studio. Wow. Um, that's pretty cool. The biggest thing with drums is finding someone who can tune them, not the microphone preamplifiers. To tune the drums? Just source sound. Yeah. Leave it flat. Don't put anything on it. 
that's if you can just get good musicians good good tones that's it's what true, you, you know i have learned this uh recently i had vusi kamala was the drummer on graceland and that man has stories on top of stories stories that have never been told like i've also got him coming up because his stories are fucking crazy but he's this old legendary legendary drummer who played on everything and i noticed we were doing a uh like a session with him but when a good drummer walks in and tunes the drums and you haven't put fucking anything on it, the kit just sounds amazing. Well, and that's all those right. like, yeah, but it's partly the drummer, I think, as well. Well, you know, tuning. that's sound in, sound out. I mean, the, the, you know, people have spent so much, um, so that people have spent so much on the technology to make microphones good. And I'll tell you who's making great mics is Tully McCulley in Cape Town. He makes right, the yeah, Tull, yeah. he makes the Tull microphones. And in fact, look here, I use them myself. I have this one over here. I, huh. This is a Tull 47 that I use on vocals on on uh, on so many records. And and I have the Tull uh, G12, which I use on guitars, which now Joe uses on his live rig, which uh, Bob Rock uses on all his recordings. And, cool. and I'm happy to have been a big part of um, those microphones being a success. But when you have great microphones, um, you, you know, they they capture sound. I mean. I do these. I do workshops with this console, and I tell people, you know, when we're doing everything, I said, "What you don't understand about a console is that these are tools to try and help you, but in essence, they are, and in this case, seventy-two channels of ways to fuck up music." And <laughs> and I have made hit records, and I and I'll tell them, and I'll I'll and I'll put, give them examples like. Uh, like Pink on that Aerosmith record, right? Which was never going to be on the record, which was a big hit single. That that so that mix has zero reverb on it, zero EQ on it, zero compression on it. it all it is is faders and pan pots. There's nothing else on that record, and there and it, because it was a rough mix, because the record was already finished, and so I pushed it up. I just pushed the faders up, and so and there's a few other records that I have that have been successful without having been you know um treated by a console now this i'm not saying that you have to do that with everything but there's every way you can fuck up a record using a console and um and i think that's the thing to learn is that these are tools to help make things better but you know it shit in shit out i mean it unless you have you know, good sound, really good microphones. You should be able to put them in front of a singer. A good singer will sound good. Put yeah. a good microphone on a drummer. You can put two microphones on a drummer, and they sound great. You put, yeah. you know, you if you get a good pair of, of of mics on a on a drum kit, and the guy knows how to tune the drums, they'll sound amazing. You know, it's like when you start trying to EQ everything to death and back. Uh, Either there's something wrong with your ears, or there's something wrong with the with the the, the sound. So um, you need to figure that out pretty early on, I think. Mm. Cool. Love your work, Kev. Great, Cheers, nice to meet you, John. Go have a good day, and I'll, we'll chat soon. I'm supposed to go and meet someone for Negronis now. I'm going to go get there and go like I'm already drunk. Good for you. I'll take that. Cheers, mate. See you I'll, soon. I'm about to have a meeting where I'm going to have to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Later, bye. Bye.